Hi, listeners. This episode is part one of our talk with the legendary Ron Meyer. He was a co-founder of CAA, head of Universal Pictures for 25 years, uh, but we didn't come close to getting through everything we wanted to get through with him. So we did ask him back for part two. Uh, so tune in next week for part two. When things get a little bit spicy, uh, we talk about tattoos and indiscretions and not really regretting anything and uh, just, you know, the overall miracle of life. So tune in next week for part two. Hello, everybody. Hi. Has it been forever? Is that just my imagination? It has been forever. No, we're in a new season already. Well, yeah. recently, and, and, we're in, and we're at war. And recent yeah. things, it hasn't been forever because she and I have been together. Yeah. Forever. That's true. That's true. Um, anyway, we're on the rags for those of you that are new joining us. And do you know why we're on the rags? Because? Because you are. Risa. Amy. And you are. Amy and with an A. I am Gloria. Mm-hmm. Sloan. Sloan. Okay, so how is everybody? A little stressed. Stress, yeah. Stressful week. Stressed, confused, yeah. bewildered, depressed. No. Everything. I'm kind of depressed. Why? You are, why? I don't really know. Well, let's well talk- there's lots of reasons to be depressed. Let's Maybe. talk about some of the things yes. that are happening no, no, in let's... the world so that we know that are depressed. depressed. Because also some of the things that are happening in the world mirror some of the things that our guest has been through or has done. That's right. Yeah. We have a remarkable guest today and it is a remarkable time in the world right now. Except I'm sure Amber Heard never shit on his bed. Oh, Oh, God. What a way to kick off the hour. That is in the news. That, that is, is in, in the, the news. news. That is a big deal. We yes. read about it or watch it every oh day. Right? It's in Deadline Hollywood every day. And I kind of, look, I think that Johnny Depp is a good man. I've known him or vaguely a little bit for decades. And he's always been kind and generous and a good human being. So there. And I, I agree. Uh, uh, it just shows you how one man can take a a whole nation down and one man can, one woman can destroy uh, someone's life. Do you know, she is so disgusting. Yeah. She, um, in a dressing room, I'm not going to tell the story because it's even too gross for me to say, <laughs> but in the dressing room, my husband did a show with, with Johnny Depp, with his band, the Hollywood Vampires. And after the show, we were in the dressing room and she was sitting there next to Jack, his son, who was probably 10 or maybe 11 at the time and proceeded to have a sex talk with him. And oh my God. so vulgar and so vile. I actually had to leave the room. It made me feel sick. That's terrible. That I think that's child abuse. And I can't believe she's trying well, I can't to believe you didn't say anything. Oh, that's I, not the glow we know. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I probably, yeah, I should have. I should have called child. I don't like you to. But let me just say, let me just say, as, as, as toxic and gross as all of these stories are, you have to remember, he picked her. Like there, I think some, you know, problems beget problems beget yeah. problems. But, and, but wait a minute, a- Amy. Yes. If you go back to his child, uh, yeah. his history of his life, sometimes you reenact it with the person you choose and he, his mother abused his father. And sometimes you marry what you know or you're attracted in some weird way if you don't get help before you get into a life is hard uh, and situation. Yes. By the way, there are people put on the best face in the beginning of their relationship, don't they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes, we do. So, yeah. okay, so that's one thing that's in the news that maybe we'll get to that. With, maybe. Yeah, we can move on. I feel better just talking about but, that but little bit. Also, got it off. <laughs> also in the world is a vile human being. Other than her. Bombing a wonderful country mm-hmm. well committing genocide that too yeah war i mean crime. War yeah. Crime. And, and, <laughs> our, and our guest maybe has something to say about that yeah also. yeah sure that, that's right sure. hollywood is going to make many many movies about this era not just the pandemic 
of what we've all been through in the last two and a half years or two, you know, 15 months, whatever it is, but also uh, how, how can this happen again? Yeah. We just had Holocaust Remembrance Day and the most famous Holocaust survivor of Dallas, who is an amazing person died on Holocaust Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. I think was April 24th. And we have a, a whole new Holocaust museum and he's kind of the star of it, but a remarkable man as well. But uh -huh. how can this happen? We always say, don't let it happen and it's happening. Mm -hmm. And the world is letting it happen. It shouldn't, and it shouldn't let it happen. But what is the answer? What do we as Americans or what does our government um, do? Well, should we, should we have what people need to do? People have to stop being hypocrites. Right. If you don't want to deal with horrible, disgusting, authoritarian regimes who commit uh, human atrocities, you cannot be a hypocrite and buy their oil. You right. cannot be a hypocrite and buy all their goods and make all of these deals because you want, you know, cheap stuff at Walmart. And this goes for China too. Right. So you don't get to be, you don't get to have both and then complain about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, you, I do. we know what you're saying. Yeah. Sloan, Sloan said that in our last, in our last <laughs> podcast that we have, because it's her business. There's plenty of oil in our country and our continent. Absolutely. How about Absolutely. a path to renewables and how about a path to less waste? And yes. Sloan, like you, you had sent some articles to, to us about um, repairing all of the sort of like toxic waste that's happening and how just doing that would be the equivalent of getting every single car off the road in the world. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's so many things that can be done, but we just let like money and energy slip through our fingers at all times because we want it all whenever we want it or something. I don't also, know. I mean, this is a whole nother, the whole energy story is yeah. a whole podcast, but absolutely we could be totally independent. We do have a guest today who is a big deal or not. What is he a big deal or no? Sort of. Here, I'm going to tell you about him okay. a little bit. His name is Ron Meyer. He's had a 50 year career as one of Hollywood's most popular moguls. He was a high school dropout and a former Marine whose street smarts and charm propelled him into becoming one of the industry's most powerful agents. He then became the president of Universal Studios 25 years ago and was in charge of theme parks and movie studio operations. His was the longest reign, studio reign, in Hollywood history, thanks to his ability to produce major hits, including Aaron Brockovich, A Beautiful Mind, Eight Mile, Meet the Parents, The Fast and the Furious, and Despicable Me. He's clear and he's honest. You never have a problem with him or his ego. I am proud to introduce my friend, Ron Meyer. Yay. This is, let's introduce us. You know yes, me, I'm please. Lisa. That's Gloria. Hi, Ron. Hello. That's Amy bottom there. And that's Sloan right up there. Anyway, nice to see you guys. Nice to meet you guys. Thanks for even thinking I should do this. Well, we thought We're you excited. should. We just introduced you, but you know what we should... Well, we just introduced you and some of your life mirrors some of the things that happened in the world. So we should start out with you, the beginning of you, because your parents also, the, your parents experienced what's going on in the world today, didn't they? Yeah, well, it, I mean, it's certainly, a, 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 you hope it's not as bad what's going on now as it was then, but probably there's a version of it. But yeah, I'll give you my brief history. Uh, my, my parents escaped Nazi Germany in, in 1939 uh, and came to America, um, um, where I was born. And um, I, uh, I left school when I was 15 years old. Uh, I went in the Marine Corps when I was uh, uh, almost 18. Uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I, I had a lot of jobs, but I, I got a sort of miracle job at a uh, theatrical agency. I working for a man named Paul Kohner. Who was a great old time agent. He he represented William Wyler and John Huston and Ingmar Bergman and Billy Wilder and people like that. And uh, and I was uh, Charlie Bronson. I mean, we had a long list of interesting clients. And I was his driver and messenger for um, you know over five years. Um, I left and went to uh, to William Morris, and I stayed at William Morris for five years. And uh, and five of us left to start Creative Artist Agency, where I stayed for twenty years. And, uh, 
uh, left Creative Artists Agency some 27 years ago and went to Universal where I stayed for 25 years. So that kind of gives you the broad strokes. Okay, so we have to go backwards though. First of all, why did they let somebody into the Marines that was 17? Well, because you could join when you were 17 and a half. If you had your parents uh, uh, allowing you to, to join, you could do that. So you had to have your parents' permission. And I, although I didn't have a high school diploma, uh, I'd agreed to get it while I was in the Marine Corps. But there was those days, there was no computerized systems or any way to follow it up. So I just didn't do it. So it, it just, you know, it didn't happen. You could probably so, do a lot more back then than you can now. There's a lot more tracking devices. Yeah, there were, yeah, there were no computers. There was nothing to really kind of, you know, find out what you did yeah. and didn't do. And, and, and in those days, they were happy to get anybody to sign up. And so, uh, you know, there was an active draft. And so people were getting drafted into the army. And so, you know, they were happy to have an enlist, someone enlist. So I was one of them. But when you were in, okay, so one of the other things that mirrors what's happening today, you were quarantined when you were in the Marines. Is that right? Well, I was, <clears> I mean, for a minute. Well, it sounds more dramatic <laughs> that I had the measles. Right. Okay. And, but still, they <clears throat> and so, so of course you were quarantined because they didn't want to give, you know, the, the other hundreds of people you were exposed to every day, the measles. <laughs> so I caught it and I was put in a, uh, uh, what they call a sick bay, uh, but like a room by myself. And, you know, those days there was certainly no internet. There was no, they, they, they didn't give you a television, you know, you were the, the military and, and I was in a room and I, you know, there was no, I didn't have any magazines. I mean, my mother sent me two books. I, I, you know, the story Risa and I, I had, um, uh, one was called the Amboy Dukes, which is about the kids in trouble, which I'd always been. And the other was called the Flesh Peddlers by a, a man named Stephen Longstreet about a guy who had been, that um, was in the agency business. I mean, there's a fictitious agency, but a guy, you know, I always, I tell the story always, he, he drove fast cars and went out with beautiful women. And I thought, God, when I get out of here, I don't want to be Not that for me. jerk. I, yeah, I didn't want to be that jerk I'd always been. I'll be this jerk instead. Oh, and so that, that's what happened. Did you live in New York at the time? No, no, I've never lived in New York. I was born in LA and- oh. Except, you know, when I was in the military, I, I, I always have lived here. And so then you went out, because how hard is it, though, for a young person to get a job at an agency? I mean, it is now, but then you well, went Well, it was, it was, I mean, it's, it was hard. What happened was that I, uh, you know, when I got out of the service, I, 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 I knew there was such a thing as the agency business. I didn't really know anything about show business. You know, I was one of those people who, even though I, I lived in West L.A., and not too far from what Fox Studios used to be. Um, uh, I, you know, I thought movies, when they finished shooting them uh, on a Thursday, they'd release them on Friday. You know, I, <laughs> I, don't. You know, I, had, you know, I had no concept of, of what the movie business was or anything like that. I was a real novice. And, uh, but I knew there was such a thing as the agency business. And so I went, um, I forget how I got the list, but I got that list. I think I went to the Screen Actors Guild and asked questions. I don't even remember what I did at the time. But I was enterprising and I got a list of all the agents in town and I went literally door to door. By the way, I didn't have an answering service. Um, I was very unsophisticated. I had, I had one suit, you know, my, it fit me like Abraham Lincoln's suit in those bad pictures fit him. You know, the, the pants came up to just above my ankles. Um, it looks good. You know, now. <laughs> yeah, probably today it's fashionable. Yeah, it is. But I, I went to, to, I don't know, probably 50, 60 agencies and you know, including William Morris and all those agencies. And I, and I filled out applications when they would allow me to, you know, many of them said we're not hiring and I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. I was really very unsophisticated about it. And every time I met somebody, I would tell the story when I would teach, I'd be asked to teach a class or anything like this at school, because I said, anything is possible. Um, I, I went, I don't know if anybody tried to reach me because I didn't have, there was no way for anybody to reach me. I didn't have an answering service. So you, if you weren't home to answer the phone, uh, they didn't get you. Um, and so I, um, uh, I, I asked everybody that I knew, anybody I'd meet, literally. I mean, when I'd get my hair cut, when I'd get my car fixed, you know, anybody in the agency business, I was just looking for introductions. And I was working at a clothing store called Zeidler and Zeidler at the time. And that's really what I did for a living. And so I went looking for jobs, any chance I had at the agencies. And I worked days and nights at Zeidler and Zeidler. And, and, Ultimately, 
I got the job through, I, I want to say this right, because I've never quite accurate about it. My mother had a girlfriend, a best friend, whose brother's sister was married to Paul Conner's brother. Oh. <laughs> and, and through that, I got an interview at the Conner Agency. And they'd had a messenger who had been working them for many years. And there was no opening. It was a small company. And I was working at Zeidler. Zeidler nobody. I've never heard from anybody. And out of the blue, they called me on a, a, a Friday, a Thursday, I think, and said, our, our messenger just quit. Do you still want the job? And I said, of course. And I was making about, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. In those days, I was making about $40 a week living in, a, in an apartment with, you know, five guys, you know, in a flea bag place. And they said, we, we, the job is open. And if you want it, we pay $75 a week, give you a gas credit card wow. and pay your lunches. Wow. I was rich overnight. I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and so I, I said, sure. And I, and I started on Monday and, uh, and that was it. It was just, it was, you know, it, it, it wasn't easy, but it, it, it did happen, but, yeah, you have to, I mean, they weren't interested in my education. They weren't interested in my background. They were just, they needed somebody. And they remembered this guy, Ron, who worked at Zeidler and Zeidler. And so that's fun. how they called me. I love it. So it was just a, it was, it was a fluke. It was just one of those things that happened. So. How long did you stay there? At Conor? Yeah. Well, over a little over five years. And then how did you get from Conor to William Morris? Same kind of thing. I, I, I decided that I, there was no future for me at Conor because they had no advancement or no ability to advance anybody. And so I went to, uh, I again, went, you know, pounding on doors. Uh, I still had the job, but any chance I had, I went looking for a job and I used the Conor agency kind of as my calling card. And again, through somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, uh, they got me an interview with a man named Phil Weltman at William Morris. And by the way, no one else offered me a job. So it wasn't like I had choices, but I had about six different interviews with Phil Weltman and they had never hired anybody to be at that those days as an agent from the outside. Um, but they needed somebody in the TV talent department um, on the lowest level imaginable. And they offered me the job. They, they paid me $110 a week. And so once again, I was rich. Um, and, and so I left Conor and, and went to William Morris and, and that, that's what happened. Who were the big agents at William Morris at that time? Well, Stan Kamen was, was in those yes. days, he was sort of the premier agent uh, in the world, actually. He represented Steve McQueen. And you can, in, in those days, Steve McQueen was the, the, the biggest star in the world. And so, and everybody below Steve McQueen, if that was the right way to say it, but he had a huge client list, an important client list, and he was really the number one agent. There was another agent named Lenny Hershan who represented Walter Matthau and Clint Eastwood and, um, uh, and Jack Lemmon. And so, you know, there were a, a lot of, to me, when I got the job at the Morris office, you know, I, I thought I worked for the Pentagon. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I was working at the most important facility in the, in the world. Um, and so I, you know, I thought I'd be there the rest of my life, but that that's, was sort of my you know, beginning. Okay. I, I know I'm monopolizing everything. Well, I'm but... curious who your biggest, who your first big client was and how you got well, that person. Well, Mike Ovitz and I became very good friends and, and both the William Morris at the same time. And we decided that we would go out and, and sign some people. We realized that that was kind of the, the calling card. And so our, 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 we, we, we went to, I don't even know how we ended up doing it, but we ended up going to all in the family tapings at uh, the beginning. And we got, we met Norman, uh, who I'm still very friendly with, Norman Lear, but we signed Sally Struthers. And she was, if, for if people that don't know, she played Gloria on All in the Family. And that was our first real big client. And, okay. and that was, you know, it was a big client for us. And I, you know, we, you know, like agents do, you know, we pursued her and convinced her that we would, you know, change her life and change her career and do what we believe we could do. And so she was the first big client we had. And I, and, and, and I did signed you do a, those things. Did you, change your life? did you change your life? No, I mean, look, she was hugely important in those days, but she was doing a TV series, one of the most popular TV series in yeah. history at that certainly at that time, but maybe would still be today. Right. And so, no, I mean, we got her some jobs. We got work for her. I remember we got her, put her in a, a couple of movies and did some things. We did a good job, but we, 
you know, but it was a big deal for us. And and then I, I signed a man named Jack Weston. Um, if you if you you if you saw if you saw his face, you'd recognize him. He's a, a, a an overweight character actor. Um, if you remember a movie called The Cincinnati Kid uh, with Steve McQueen, uh, he was one of the guys at the poker table, sweating all the time. But he was the he was the best friend of Mr. Limpet in the Mr. Limpet movies, the Don Knotts movies. You're all too young for this, but <laughs> yes. he was my. But but he and 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 we we signed a few people. I mean, you know, in retrospect, they probably you know to us they were the the most important people on the planet. Um, probably in those days the, they would not have been, but but they were important. And within the agency, we we were like at least we were we thought we were signers. We thought we were out doing what agents are supposed to do. Exactly. I was like you. I started at William Morris and Kevin and Kevin Uvane and I did that. We went out together yeah, no. to try to sign people. You do it in pair somebody well, that you, you feel comfortable with. Well, you guys did it well. We we probably Mike and I were were young and we were really on on the bottom of the totem pole of of many 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 you know sort of important agents of that company. We were the the lowest on the on the pecking order. Oh, we were low. We were in the New York office. We were we just had more nerve than we had sense well we did so, too i mean you have, you have to if you can succeed in the agency business for sure it's so true and the well you talked about this some of your mentors or your role models or the agents that you looked up to or or were mentoring mentor you who were some of that who were well, they? phil Weltman more than anybody i mean he really made a, a huge difference i mean he was a, a we became very close but he was a very tough boss and 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 during the day, he, he was hugely tough on me and he loved baseball, loved Dodger games and had season tickets and he took me all the time. And when we would go together, we were like pals. But the minute you get to work in the morning, you know, he wanted me to cut my hair and wear my suit and, you know, be I mean, I, I was, he was a, 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 a drill instructor and I was his soldier. Well, at least you had been in the military. They were really <laughs> They were really big on dress code at William Morris. Oh yeah, they were. But and he was an amazing guy. He was really an amazing guy. But but he really made a difference uh, for me. So if I had a, a a mentor, so to speak, he's probably the only one that ever kind of mentored me in in my career. Um, Ron, can I ask a question, Lisa? Uh, I heard you. Uh, I heard you talk about was it Paul Coner's assistant? What? Uh, how she taught you? something that I think everybody should learn early on in their career, which is amazing. Well, well she was, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I, I must say, I guess while I worked for, I really hated her, really hated her. I mean, she was very rough on me and, un, and embarrassingly so. Um, uh, had no qualms about humiliating me in front of people and she would yell at me. And I, you know, I thought here I was a veteran. I thought I deserved more respect. But of course, you know, I also needed the job. Uh, she was very, very tough on me. Um, in hindsight, I, I probably appreciate a lot of what she taught me and probably I should probably give her more credit as a mentor than I do, but I don't know that she did it to teach me or to just get me to do the job right. Um, but she was very, very tough on me and, and she demanded things that have made a difference in my life. I mean, you know, I used to, uh, I, I, to this day, I write down everything. I don't leave anything to my little brain. Me too. And so I write down if I, if I, I mean, I, I have four kids and five grandkids. I, I call my four kids every day and I, I still make a list and I, they're on my list. Um, I do it because I'm capable of a thousand things happening and having called three of them and forgetting to call yeah. one of them. Um, not because I don't love them, but because I got my day just gets jammed. And before I know it, the day ended and I forgot what I did and didn't do and should have done and shouldn't do. Sorry, I'm here at home alone doing pints. I'll let the phone ring if you're okay with you guys. Um, they, um, no, so I have, um, um, but I, I, you know, she was, she demanded that I, I used to she'd give me a, a, a eight things to do or 10 things to do. And I'd get 80% of them, right. And she would get crazy. She would say, how, how stupid are you? Why would you not get all of them? Right. And of course she's right, you know, but I didn't write them down. So I thought if I got Eight out of ten. Right? I, was, I was doing a good job. You know, <laughs> let me, I know it sounds so kind of mundane, but even today I would go to a restaurant and when a waiter or waitress doesn't write down the order and it comes back wrong, you wonder why did they write it down? 
right. all they do is write down a, 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 a burger medium rare, yeah. you know, that so the little things like that made a real difference. And but she really was a taskmaster. And, and that probably more than anything, what she taught me was, you know, do what you're supposed to do, do it the best job you can, you know, so if I came away from that years later, you know, after she was long gone, I, I came to kind of appreciate a lot of the lessons that she taught me. The only difference was that Phil Weltman, um, as tough as he was, you know, he was he never humiliated me in front of anybody or anything like that. And as dumb as I was, probably and deserved it. Uh, he did. She did. But so did he that, give, but did that he was the difference. You, did he give you the free lunches she gave you? Pardon? The assistant? Oh, yeah. No, no. I, the free lunches were part of the job. Yeah. There, there, was a, there was a restaurant. There were two restaurants in the neighborhood. They were on Sunset Strip. There was a, a deli called The Gaiety. And if I and one day a week, I was able to go to a restaurant called the Cock and Bull, and I could go to both places oh and sign. And the Cock and Bull, the difference oh. was it was a five dollar lunch, and so you couldn't do that too often. Wow. But the Gaty, you could get a bucket so cool of sandwich that. every day. So uh, I don't mean to digress, but look behind Sloan's head. There's a picture of you. Look. Oh God. Is, <laughs> is, like you. So well, I, I don't know if you remember. I met you at Hillcrest. I don't know, three years ago in January. Uh, I do remember. No, I do remember that. And, yeah, you have uh, yeah. that picture. And I, have, I, have, I, have, I have the other one. Right. Oh, so I, think, I did not know this was, I did not know you and I didn't know this was you when I had to have it. Well, and it's a good it. likeness. It's a very good likeness. Of I actually thought it was I, could tell. I know, but I, I love it. It's I mean, very I, funny. I do remember when you came to me and I thought it was an amazing thing. I No, you know what? It. Uh, I mean, the, the it was given to me as a gift and the artist based on a, a photo of mine and the artist did, I think, two versions of it. And you got one of them, I'm flattered to say, although I have nothing to do with it. I love and it. the other one, well, I think it, it, right now, yes. and when, of course, I look at the other one, which is very similar to that. And I think I said, I, I kind of see me there, you know, <laughs> so funny. that's funny. Really funny. Well, I, I have to show you something else because I showed it to my husband and he was like oh my god he he i mean he was he was hot for you when i showed him your picture oh, right. uh, <laughs> like my husband the great oh. hair great glasses great tan what else do you uh, it was a long time ago i guess or is that, that recent, is that must be a recent oh, wait wait god. let me see that must be a recent photo you know <laughs> I, I still have by the way i even though i don't look at it, i shaved my head while and I love it shape, but otherwise I still have the same hair. And tan. I I'm mean, that's bald. the perfect Hollywood yeah, uh, agent. <laughs> Wait, okay, so going back, why did you- I'm, I'm honored that you have my two of my photos there. I know, she <laughs> looks at your pictures every day. Okay, I just wanted to tell you. Scary. <laughs> why did, okay, tell us about you. I know that you've said this before, but tell us about you leaving William Morris. What'd you do? Why did you and how did you? You have the time for this whole story? Yeah. I, no, what happened? What yeah. happened was, that, as you remember, we say at the Morris office, there was a, a a very serious hierarchy, and and they took themselves seriously. So in this in the L.A. staff meetings, there was a, a big conference table where um, the the big bosses sat, ten or fifteen of them, all the the big guys. Then there was another set of chairs around that table, a circular uh, group of chairs that sat behind the big bosses, and they were sort of the VPs of the company. Then there was literally a third level of chairs that sort of the, the people that were there, the senior agents, then there was a peanut gallery where you, were, you, you felt like you were a mile away, but you were literally five rows back um, and were, were allowed to come in on a, a sort of free pass from, your, uh, uh, from the company and listen to what all the, the, the smartest, best people in the company were saying. And we had just lost Steve McQueen. I mentioned Stan came and represented him, but Freddie Fields, um, Stolen? And, uh, C uh, CMA, had signed Steve McQueen. And it was a huge event, a huge loss. I mean, I, I, I was a pipsqueak there. So, but I was even in funk over it. I mean, I, I thought, you know, what a horrible thing, you know, lose, you know, the biggest star in the world and to, to, a, to a rival agency. And Sam Weisbord, who was the head of the company, a horrible little guy, an ugly little man, uh, uh, announced that he had just signed Ann Miller, 
you, you probably none of yeah. you know, she Lisa will know Ann Miller is, no one else will know who she is. Was Ann Miller was a, a famous tap dancer. Oh. Um, and if you look at old Mickey Rooney movies and that, she was, she was a great tap dancer and, you know, kind of a character lady. And, uh, uh, but she was at, at that time, her career had sort of come to an end. I mean, she was, you know, not elderly, but, but talented woman, but not, in my opinion, or was it in my opinion, the caliber of what w the head of the company, the head of the most important agency that ever existed, right. in my opinion, should be signing. And I, so he announced that he signed Ann Miller. And I, at that moment, I still remember, I thought, this is my moment to make my bones here. And I, from the back of the room, raised my hand. Yeah. No one could believe that the, that, and when they put their binoculars on, they could find someone back there actually was going to say something. And so everything kind of looked back at me. And I said, Ann Miller is great, you know, but I said, we're the most important agency with the most important clients. And then we still, they represented Elvis Presley and everybody like that still. And I said, we're the most important agency, the most important clients. But we just lost Steve McQueen and we should mobilize this entire agency to go after Freddie Field's clients and CMA's clients and not you know, and not just sign Ann Miller. And Sam Weisbord, the little four foot tall guy, jumped out of his seat and he says, fuck you, fuck you, you asshole. And he started screaming at me. He must have said, fuck you 200 times to me. He was out of his mind. He was beat red. And I, oh. I had thought that I was going to become a hero there. And he was screaming. He screamed, and I kept going, bup, 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 trying to explain. He said, fuck you, shut up. It was a, a kind of famous moment at the agency. And I sat down and I, I, obviously my life flashed before me. I mean, it really was, you know, I, I, there was, I had no job prospects. I had no money. I had no, you know, I, I couldn't imagine what had happened, how this all went wrong. Um, I, I, so Phil Weltman came to me after, first of all, people avoided me. I, I was like, had a contagious disease <laughs> for a, the longest time because I had really, you know, and in hindsight, I obviously handled it badly. Uh, as much as I didn't like him, mm -hmm. I, I handled the whole thing poorly. And he uh, and he never spoke to me again uh, in the next two years. Ignored me when wow. I walked down the hall. Did it? Oh my God! But Phil Weltman. Phil Weltman was forcibly retired after thirty-five years there, and he came to me and he said, "If you," um, he said, "When I'm gone," he said, "You're going to get fired." He said, "I I'm oh. protecting you." But Sam Weisbord hates you, and he's forcibly retired me, even though they were best friends, actually, and forcibly retired Phil. And he said, and, and you'll be you're going to be let go. Hmm. So you got to think about what you're going to do. And that was the, the germ of CAA, of starting CA. I mean, How old uh, I, pardon? How old were you at that point with the screaming match, like mid-20s or? Yeah, at that point, I was probably, we started CA when I was 30, so I was 28. Uh -huh. And and so I, because I think it lasted two years after that, barely two years. Mm -hmm. And um, and I convinced, I went to Mike Ovitz, and I convinced him that he and I should start a, a, a mama pop agency. Mm -hmm. Jack Weston and Sally Struthers and and his couple clients. And and they liked him there a lot and i but i convinced him that we were, we should leave we we're best of friends and i and i talked him into it and and at the same time um uh, uh roland perkins and bill haber and mike rosenfeld were considering leaving because phil weltman was going to leave the company and being forcibly retired and they thought maybe they should go off on their own and they approached me uh not mike and I said, if, if I ever left here, I'd, I'd leave with Mike. Um, and they didn't know Mike as well as they knew me because I worked for those guys. And uh, we, we ended up having a meeting, the five of us. Mike and I were not really thinking we'd leave with them, but wanting to kind of know what they were thinking. And, um, they, uh, and, and we had just an extraordinary meeting. And when we left, we, Mike and I had some questions, but we went to a, a very good friend of ours, went to uh, Howard West, um, who along with George Shapiro discovered Jerry Seinfeld among other things. Um, and he had been at Morris before that he left uh, to be in the management business with, with 
George Shapiro. And he said, you guys, you have to go with those guys. He said, it'll make a big impact and it'll be important and you should do it. Otherwise we probably wouldn't have done it. And we, we decided that we would uh, take a year if I could survive it um, before we went into business, we would save some money. I had no money, um, I had debts, but we, we would save some money. We would um, find offices, uh, hire assistants, uh, get clients. And then the day we left, we'd open up our offices and people would be, you know, answering phones and working like a normal business would be running. Uh, and we were uh, two weeks into that plan and we were found out and fired. Um, and so otherwise, I, I don't I don't even know now what CA would be. Who knows a year later? Who oh. knows? You know, things would have changed that. You know, I would have been fired for sure, but but who knows where Mike would have been or Roland or Bill or, or Funny. you know, yeah. who knows? It was a blessing in disguise. Where were your first offices? The, the very first office was a, a man named David Walper. What happened was that we, when we were fired, people, you know, no one would have known who we were, but Sam Weisbord made a, we, we were fired on a Wednesday and didn't have much to do for, for few days we were kind of trying to figure it out we were just on the streets and um with no sense of organization no money i had borrowed some money from a distant cousin to live on i mean we had no real plan and no clients and uh uh sam weisberg made a speech that wednesday morning that we were fired about you know getting rid of these traitors and these bad guys and this whole thing he was a stupid little man and they um uh <laughs> And, and uh, uh, the trades, obviously, the Hollywood Reporter, the Daily Variety were, were the only means of communication in the industry. And they were very important those days. And, and all three, had, all, both papers had headlines saying, five agents leave William Morris. It was like a big event. They made a, it wasn't a big event. It, but no one would have cared if Sam Weisbord hadn't made a big thing of it. But because he made that announcement in the staff meeting, it leaked out. And it made it sound like some important thing had happened. Honestly, it, would have, it was a non-event. So first thing I have is David Walper, who was a, a, a wonderful documentary producer, um, had an office on La Cienega and Third Street and, and called and said, Do you guys need a place to work from? So that Friday, we, we went and moved into his office for a week and had one phone and one room with the mm -hmm. five of us. And we found a, a, a space on... Wilshire Boulevard, the Hong Kong Bank Building, which doesn't exist anymore, but Wilshire, Wilshire and Rexford and on the corner there. And we found five offices and one conference room. And we went out for 250 and we bought a, a conference table and we brought, you know, people have heard the story of folding chairs and, and card tables from home. Everybody had them at home in those days. Um, and uh, uh, and that, that was the beginning. And we, we each... Each of the four of my of the five of us have, were married. I wasn't, and their wives worked one day a week, and we hired an assistant who came from William Morris, and that was the beginning of the company. But Ron, CA became the biggest agency in the world. You all signed everybody. You signed well, every huge star, and became well, huge. Yeah, we were. We had a lot of things went it, to our advantage. We we were at the right place at the right time. We really were. We. I think we did a good job, but we were we were very fortunate. I mean, unfortunate things happened. I mean, poor Stan came and he he passed away, right. and William Morris had no succession plan, so his clients were kind of free. But even before that, uh, the, the probably the most important thing that happened is we took a a sixth partner. Uh, we brought a man named Marty Baum in, and Marty Baum uh, really was is sort of the unsung hero of, of CAA. Um, uh, he made all the difference. We were, we were we were kind of good television agents representing, you know. We quickly signed a, a lot of good TV guest shot actors and TV one shot writers that, but didn't have a very important client list. Um, and Marty Baum, Mike, and I convinced Marty Baum that he should join us. And um, and his uh, Marty Baum had been an agent at a company called General Artist Agency. He left and became a. Um, a the head of what was then ABC Films, they had a film division, and they made Straw Dogs, they made uh, uh, a cabaret, they made a number of very important films, 
and Marty was sort of applauded for his role in it, but he decided to leave it. He took out an ad in the trades that said, I've decided to come back to my first love, the agency business. And Mike and I saw that ad and Marty Baum, his, his big claim to fame was that he, an important one was that he, he discovered Sidney Poitier while well, Sidney was a dishwasher and represented him through his entire career. And so Marty going into business immediately signed Sidney Poitier and he signed Peter Sellers and Blake Edwards and um, uh, Richard Attenborough and a number of, of very important people in the industry. And Mike and I convinced Marty that he should join us. And he became our sixth partner. And frankly, that changed our world. Once we represented those people, um, you know, Sydney was then a huge, huge star, still one of the biggest stars in the world. And so once he represented, there was a calling card. And so the combination of Marty joining us, poor Stan came in passing away, um, you know, other agents doing a mediocre job and us doing a better than mediocre job. Um, we went on a, a signing spree. And, and once you were able to sign, you know, a couple of big stars. We, we, we made a relation with lawyers and stuff. So, you know, we signed, you know, Sylvester Stallone. We signed uh, 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 Sean Connery, Paul Newman, Robert Redford, uh, Dustin Hoffman, people like that. And that, that really changed our world. You know, you, so. What's, who's the biggest star or the, that you have the biggest connection to or the most proud of in those early days at CAA? Do you have any? Well, that's a, it's a tricky answer to that question. I mean, Sylvester Stallone really changed my career, uh, me personally, because uh, he, was, he, had, he was the biggest star in the world for a moment. And he had just finished Rocky and, and was about to do Rambo. And, and he was, Stan came and had represented him. And I, I had met him casually and, and, um, and became friendly-ish. And we stayed together for 20 years, but I... I and so my signing Sly, um, it gave me a calling card and it enabled me to, to kind of, you know, sign a lot of people. And, and, and he really, we had a great time together. It was a, obviously a great client. I was, you know, I, I was, I was learning on the job. I mean, I was way over my head. Hmm. Um, you know, people were coming after the biggest star in the world. And I wasn't prepared to, to really know what to do, but I, you know, I caught up, I guess, quickly. I, we, we lasted together a long time. And so, you know, I, I have closer relationships with people, you know, Michael Douglas is one of my closest friends. So I still have a lot of relationships with my former clients, but, uh, and Barbara Streisand and I are best of friends and uh, Risa and Cher and I yeah. are very close friends. But I have, you know, I've maintained a relationship with a lot of my clients, but, but Sly was probably the one person who really, really made the difference. I mean, representing someone like that, especially in those days, it was just, you know, I was hanging on for dear life and it was just a great ride. I read that The Rock says that you're like a second father to him is that true to who the rock well i don't know i'm i'm flattered we we have a great relationship a great friendship i i i i don't think of myself as that but i but i was i was fortunate enough to you know be there to hire him uh, or be part of hiring him uh for his first film but i i we became friends and i you know i have great admiration and affection for him and you have the same hairstyle, so it's easy. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Cher, you know, share credits you. I, I, I told you this before that for, on Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, which, you know, it came to her. I was trying to get her to do it. And when I'd lose patience, I'd call you and say, it's your turn. And so then you would call her and convince her because, you know, share is very difficult to convince to do anything, really. And then now, if you read about it in print, because it was one of the great experiences of her life, she'll always say, my friend Ronnie Meyer told me to do this. She you. gives me more credit than I do. You and I deserve equal credit. <laughs> and it, it was one of those things that just kind of worked. You know, it, uh, you know we, we would have both gotten equal blame had it been oh, cats. Yeah. Had, yeah, had, been, had it been cats instead of Mamma Mia, you, you and I would have... <laughs> <laughs> with blame for it so it worked out at mama mia was a, a good choice it was a good good choice but no i know she's you have great relationships with actors still to this day now well, i've been very fortunate why did you you and mike left caa what made you want to leave caa well i he left a, a, about a couple months after i did um I, I never thought i'd leave i actually mike and i were a marriage gone bad and it was time for us not to be together anymore. We just, we'd, we'd done it. We'd been best friends and 
you know, not enemies, but we were just, we were, we were, we were becoming more and more estranged. We were just a marriage gone bad. It's the only way I could describe it. And uh, happens. he, uh, and, and, and he was the master of the universe. He was, everybody wanted him for everything. And so, you know, he'd been offered the Disney job. He'd been offered the Sony job. He'd been offered, you know, and Edgar Bronf and he were very good friends. And he was, you know, he had sort of committed to Edgar that he would go to Universal. And he just, you know, whatever happened, he, he over negotiated and the Bronfmans <laughs> were disappointed in that negotiation and decided they didn't want to stay with, didn't want to go with him. And he probably, in, in fairness to him, he probably really wanted it to not work anyway. He, you know, if, if you're, if you're at a studio, you're, yes, you're the king of that studio, but you're not king of anything else. He was king of everything. And so he, he knew that. And I think in the end, he didn't want to give up that power position that he had. And, and I always hoped that he would leave and I would stay. I mean, I love being an agent and I was, I was living my dream. I was representing the people I'd always kind of fantasized about. And, you know, I thought it was just, uh, it was, I was having the time of my life. And um, he, uh, and in the end, he didn't do it. And when he didn't do it, I realized I couldn't be with him any longer. I had to get out of there. I love Bill Haver, um, but I, I just couldn't be with Mike anymore. It was just time for us to be apart. And so at the same time, um, a longer story than you have time for, but, but uh, the Bronfids approached me and they offered me the job and I, and I took it and that's what happened. Well, but, but you went to universe. Okay. So ultimately you went to universal and you remain there the longest head of a studio in Hollywood history. And Mike went to Disney, but what happened? He, you succeeded and he did not. I mean, is that, well, he succeeded right? other ways, you know, my, Mike, Mike succeeded in, in his own ways, whatever he wanted. You know, obviously money was very important to Mike and I think he succeeded in that way. So, you know, he probably gave up a lot to get there, but that, that for him was important. I don't know that I'd, I don't care about money that much and I would want to give up, you know, the way people view me for money. I guess that's the best way to say it. He, you know, and he, he you know, I think Mike, I speak for him, he, you know, Mike's a, a, a He's not a student. He's a teacher. He learns nothing. And so he went to Disney and instead of, you know, I mean, it's a much longer story because I, I, when he was offered the Disney job before the universal job, I tried to get him to do it. And he, he, there were aspects of it that he just wasn't willing to accept. So I said, let me go and meet with Eisner and try to make this work for you. Cause I really wanted to go. I felt it was good for him and for the agency and for me. And so it was for everybody. And I sat with Eisner and Michael said, you know, he's got to spend a year learning Disney. You know, I'll send him all over the world. He'll, he'll study Disney and learn there everything there is to know about it. And I, and I worked out the terms for Mike and I came back and I told him exactly that. And Mike didn't want to do it. You know, he, he, he came to Disney and Eisner will tell the story. You guys ever talked to him that, you know, Mike came in right away and, and all he wanted to do is be the boss, you know, didn't want to, take that year to learn things interesting Funny. yeah i had a question for you before we have to start winding down um sadly i know wait what time oh, oh, that's so sad I know, we could talk to you forever forever so here's my question <laughs> I went, I went to visit, <laughs> look at his face he's like to, no no he's like i'm done yeah. i went to fit, visit a friend of mine who lives in seattle and she had a picture and the picture said i like you a lot do you have the other one wow there were two, a well-known cartoonist did this picture. I like you a lot. Uh, and uh, she kept one and you had one. And that was Cynthia Strom. Oh, really? I love Cindy. She's great. I actually spoke to her recently, but how, I don't know what the picture, I don't know. I, I don't remember, by the way, she said she I gave remember what one. I did she, a couple of days ago, but, but she, she said she <laughs> gave you one and she kept one. And I'm talking, this was probably a year ago that I saw this picture. But can you believe she has it after all this time? Unbelievable. I mean, I haven't seen her for, I haven't seen Cindy, I, I want to say yeah, for, for 45 years, probably. Oh, spoke how, her, we spoke when she asked that? me to do something recently, but isn't that but funny? funny that that's how much of a hoarder she, she is, that she uh, has this for many years ago. I love it. That's, uh, funny. that's very funny. Well, I'm yeah, flattered I, that you kept it. That's funny. Ron, I heard you on another podcast talking about how important the movie going experience is. 
Well, I, I do but believe I that. I'll, yeah, I mean, what do you, I mean, that was obviously pre-pandemic that I, yeah, I, I... I think sadly it's changed. I, yeah. I'm still very bullish on it. I mean, I, I think, I, I think when I said it at the time, and I do believe, I did believe it, and I, I, I wish it were true still, I think it's changed. And I never thought it would change. You know, I think there's no greater communal experience than going to the movies. You know, it's, it's cheaper than a rock concert, cheaper than a book, yeah. cheaper than a, a, a sporting event. It's the greatest experience for people to be together that exists, whether you hate it or love it or laugh or cry. It, it's what a, what a great experience it used to be to sit in a theater and hate or enjoy something together. And, um, and everybody has to eventually, you got to go out with somebody or just yourself, be with people, your husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, whatever you're doing, somewhere or another, you got to do it. And I used to be very bullish on it. And I'm certainly bullish on the industry, but I'm not, you know, I think that the pandemic changed it. And I think people going to see a few good men in the theaters is not going to happen. Um, or a movie like that, or, or you know, they're going to go see, yes, they're going to go see Maverick and then go see Jurassic Park and then go see certain big event kind of films. But, you know, frankly, what was the animated film that opened this last weekend? Uh, oh, good Guys or Bad Guys? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good guy. And everybody's taking $25 million. Well, you know, that normally wouldn't have been a good number for an animated right. film. Um, but we're, ha we're having to make that a good number. You better make that film for a lot less or sell it to a streamer wow. for a lot more because otherwise you, we're all going to be out of business. So it's, it's unfortunate. You know, people, two things happen. People are afraid to sit in big crowded arenas, although they do it. Um, and and it, we've all gotten used to staying home. The screen has gotten bigger and the, the product, frankly, is, is pretty good. You know, who thought we'd ever stay home and watch 25 hours of a Spanish soap opera? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Although so, going, going to screenings at your house was one of the great experiences. Yeah, well, that's a, in, a, in a different life, you know. <laughs> but, I, but I do, you know, but I, I am bullish on the business. I just think it's changed a lot. And I, you know, I think it's unfortunate. I hope people go back to the theaters but I, I don't, I don't think it's happening very quickly. Even though we're all kind of pretending that it's going to happen, and and this, by the way, streamer business is a great business for content providers. Uh, it's a great business. You know, it's a great time to be making product and selling it. Does any of that really change anything for the world other than theaters? I mean, the production is still happening and the need is still there, right? It's just sort of yeah, that. Um, experience. I think you're better. You, you, well. Yeah. By the way, they're all high class problems I'm talking about. <laughs> People have to get adjusted to to in the industry to making less money mm -hmm. um, in every area. Mm -hmm. And you got to make the product for a reasonable price. You, uh, you know, overspending is going to get tougher and tougher to do. Um, even a company like Netflix showing their results. It's an amazing company and they and a very successful. one. But, they, yeah. you know, they, their stock has come way down and they're going to get a little tighter i can speak for them but my guess is they'll be tighter than they were yeah. and so the free spending the, that people were doing and, and competing with each other in that world of free spending will probably change a lot now that you're not at universal what's next well i'm i'm doing two things i i, I got a, a wonderful situation I'm, I'm still consulting to the country of qatar and so i've been there 18 times this past year and a half and I, I, I'm loving the people, loving the country and having a great time. They, they're they exploring being in the movie business and they treat me well and I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I became a co-CEO of a company in France called Wild Bunch. And it's a, a distribution company with 2,500 titles. I, I brought a, a, a partner and a woman named Sophie Jordan who runs it with me and she lives in France. So she, she runs it every day and I go there once a month. Um, and we have 2,500 titles and we distribute in France and Italy and Germany and Spain. And we're going to expand the company. We're in the midst of that now. We'll, we'll eventually uh, distribute in the United States. And, and it'll be, a, a, you know, in nice. a couple of years, we'll be a worldwide you know, production distribution company. Nice. So it's fun. I'm, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. And I, you know, Universal was a great experience. And, you know, there's parts of it that I miss and parts of it I don't miss. Um, I, I loved having the job. I'm just not sure I, I, I continued to love doing it. So it, it worked out fine in a bad situation. Well, you were one of the great heads of a studio ever, really. 
Well, thanks. That, that's the truth. I know. You know what? Because we have this studio until now, now. We're, we probably have to say goodbye, unfortunately. I'm really sad. I'm into this. <laughs> okay, well, this is a good one. You were spectacular. Thank you so much. Well, I'm, I'm flattered you guys asked me. Thank you. Nice to see you all. We'll, be, we'll be asking you for part two as well. <laughs> Uh-oh. Part two. Come on, anytime. Anytime. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, you guys. Nice thank, to see thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye. It was a Bye. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.